See it on Showtime. How can Showtime bring you a comedy event spanning 10 years and the planet Earth? Blast off. It's all done with smoke, mirrors, and host Lily Tomlin. I am the belle of Canada. When she welcomes Alan King. When did this become the comedy center of the world? Must have been after I left. Stephen Wright. I tried to hang myself with bungee cord. Rita Rudner. I need to give you a hint of a touch. Sit they down. saw that picture in the paper. They said they were taking the first train back to Mexico City. I advise them to take a plane. It's quicker. What are you, what are you trying to do? Bargain! With special encore performances that has been blessed by a tremendous, a tremendous amount of good fortune. For more of the warmth and wit of this beloved star, join Professor Richard Brown on the next Reflections on the Silver Screen, Jimmy Stewart, coming up next on AMC. When I first came out here as a contract player at MGM, a comedian named Ted Healy, he looked at me and he said, well, you may have a chance to uh, make, it in this, uh, make it in this business. It's quite a strange business out here. But, you, but always remember one thing. Never treat the audience as customers. Always treat the audience as partners mm -hmm. and I've never forgotten it and it's it, it's meant more to me almost than anything in the the whole uh, career that I've the whole time I, I've had in the business um, there were several directors who over your long career you have worked with your work with Henry Hathaway your work with Hitchcock and of course your work with Capra you played a character named Tony Kirby, 1938. You can't take it with you. That really takes us back to the beginning of your career. Also, the, the sort of the beginning of this uh, wonderful experience I had with Frank Capra. You know, if you scratch under the surface here, you'll find a proposal lying around. I admit it's kind of left-handed. I can't help that. I'm sort of a left-handed guy, you know. Oh, tell me. What about them? Well, Mother and Dad? Did you see the way she looked at me? I, I know just what she was thinking. Now, Alice, now listen. Now, there seems to be the impression around here that the Kirby's are ogres or something. Well, if they are, that doesn't make any difference to me. They're just potty in my hands, Alice. I never in my life wanted anything that I couldn't get if I just yelled loud enough. Worked like a charm when I was a baby, and since then I've had so much practice that I'm terrific. Here, I'll give you a general idea. Right after you did You Can't Take It With You, uh, you did uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And I think that for many people, for many people today, that film really speaks to them about what this country is about. Those things were just those things that were the values that Frank Capra had. These were very simple things. They were, they were, they were values. They were love, love of family, love of community, 
love of country, love of God. And he was able to, through Jefferson Smith, he was able to put them out on the screen. Isn't it fair also to say that they were the values that Jimmy Stewart had and that Jimmy Stewart has today also? I think so. I think so pretty much, but with Frank Capra was a great influence to me to make these values something more than just uh, things you think about, and they're a value to you as a person. I think what you're speaking of now is what movies have always been about for me. I've been teaching for 25 years now, and I have always believed that movies are not escapist entertainment, and that they are something more than entertainment, that movies show us possibilities in our life, that movies give us examples, and some of those examples are just going to another time or another place or another era. But the other things are that it shows us what we can do with our lives, and, and no better example than this film. You just reminded me, Frank uh, opened the picture in Constitution Hall in Washington, and I was making a picture out here, and I, they wouldn't let me go. And uh, Frank was in it is the big place, and uh, all the setup were there. And Frank was in a box with his wife Lou, and uh, the president of the Senate and his wife. And uh, the picture started, and there was about half. Well, it's been been on maybe almost an hour, and the film broke, oh, and God. Frank left and w w went. Uh, he he had been up to the projection room before, but he tried the door and the door was locked. And uh, he looked out the window and there was a fire escape going. And he went up the fire escape and got to the projection room, and went in. And by this time, the guy had it running again. So <laughs> he just uh, checked on on uh, everything, and everything seemed to be all right. When he got back to the box where he was sitting in, Lou was there alone, and he looked down the audience, and it was about half gone. He found out that in the Senate the next morning, the president of the Senate uh, picked out two men, and they said, uh, he said, now, uh, we didn't look at all this because it, it's, as you all know, the, the reason we didn't. Uh, I want both of you to go to the movie that's playing at so-and-so theater, and I want you to see it all the way through and come back and report to us so that we can bring our objections and maybe a suit against the uh, whole idea of this picture and writing. And three days later, he said, uh, uh, all right, uh, so-and-so and so-and-so, uh, what did you find out about uh, seeing the picture through and through? And both of them said, well, we've been trying, well, for these three days, but the lines are so long that we <laughs> haven't been able to get to see the picture. Well, mm -hmm. as time wore on, uh, the, the whole, uh, the sort of the basic things about the picture sort of came to rest and, and uh, people realized that uh, it wasn't making fun of the, uh, of the Senate, it wasn't making fun of uh, the Constitution of the United States, of, of the way our country was governed and so on. It was a, it, it, it was a it, sort of showing the responsibility of senators to stand up for what they believe is right. Yeah, and something else, Miss Saunders, the uh, the spirit of it, the idea, the uh, how do you say it? The, that's what's got to be in it. What? The Capitol Dome. On paper. I want to make that come to life for every boy in this land. Yes, and all light it up like that, too. You see, you see, boys forget what their country means by just reading the land of the free and history books. When they get to be men, they forget even more. Liberty is too precious a thing to be buried in books, Miss Saunders. Men should hold it up in front of them every single day of their lives and say, I'm free. 
think and to speak. My ancestors couldn't. I can. And my children will. Eight years ago, the Washington Press Club asked my wife Gloria and I back for a luncheon. And we went back, and they, they surprised me, and they said, actually, what we're, uh, what we're here for, but it's nice to have you have lunch with us, but what we're here for we're, is just to say, we're, we're sorry we took the attitude about uh, <laughs> Mr. Smith goes mm -hmm. to Washington, and we forgive you. And uh, we, we think that the, the whole idea of the picture is okay. <laughs> um, you and I talked before, and you told me a story about how your voice became so hoarse in that yeah. scene. Could you just share that with, yeah. it, with us now? I think I'd been on it about four days. And uh, Frank, after we, after we finished a day's work, Frank called me over and he said, you know, uh, I'm not. I'm not getting there. I, uh, you're. You're supposed to be start losing your voice, but I'm not getting the feeling that you're losing your voice. All I, you, you just seem to be doing like this. Well, that, that. That. That's nothing. You're just whispering. That. That. That's. That's not losing your voice. There's. There's not, And this worried me. And on my way home, I stopped at a doctor office and the doctor I knew and uh, he was fortunately he was still there and I uh, went in and I said doctor uh, could, could you give me a sore throat <laughs> and he just looked at me and he said could I give you a... he said I've, I've heard about you Hollywood folks but I that you're cr all crazy but uh, you, you take the cake <laughs> I, it's, I've, I've been working for 45 years, uh, learning and uh, medical school before I went into practice of uh, uh, ways to cure sore throats and to keep people from getting sore throats. And you come in here and ask me to give you a sore throat. Now come into the office here, and I'll give you the sorest throat you've ever had. And he, he said, "Put your head back," and he did a thump and a thing, and put three sort of drops down down my throat, not on my vocal cord, but just in the throat. And he said, "Now say something," and I said, <coughs> and wrote, "I can't," and I finally was able to say something. He. I said, this is just great. That This is fine. He said, well, now, this will wear off. And I, how, long, uh, how long do you have to do I said, I have, I have about two, two, three more days of this when it gets worse and worse. And he said, well, I don't, I, I can't give you this. I, you know, this is, I, I can't let you. Uh, wh wh where are you working, and what, what time do you start work in the morning? And I said, 8 o'clock. And he said, I'll be there. I don't know what happened to his practice for the next two <laughs> days. But he was there the whole time, and I, I would come in every once in a while, and I'd say, Doctor, it's better. And he'd say, bichloride of mercury. And Frank never, I know that he knew about it and everything. Frank never approached me, ne never said anything about it, Johnny. And, and uh, I know that the Actors Theater wouldn't approve uh, of, of this, but he said, you don't sound like you have a sore throat. So I got one. <laughs> and, and that, that's that's the, only, the only explanation I have. I guess this is just another lost cause, Mr. You people don't know about lost causes. Mr. Payne does. He said once they were the only causes worth fighting for. And he fought for them once. For the only reason any man ever fights for them. Because of just one plain, simple rule.
And in this world today, full of hatred, a man who knows that one rule has a great trust. You know that rule, Mr. Payne. And I loved you for it just as my father did. And you know that you fight for the lost causes harder than for any others. Yes, you even die for them. Like a man we both knew, Mr. Payne. You think I'm late. <laughs> you all think I'm late. Well, I'm not late. And I'm gonna stay right here and fight for this lost cause. Even if this room gets filled with lies like these. And the tailors and all their armies come marching into this place. Somebody will listen to me. Right after you did that, very different kind of film. Destry Rides Again, which you did for George Marshall. Yeah. And you played Tom Destry. Yeah. And worked with the great Marlena Dietrich. She sort of got to be the mainstay of the whole thing. Her sort of way of getting things uh, and, and doing the scene, giving life to the scene, what had so much to do with the whole uh, thing that it, it just amazed everybody. Yes. And she had, you know, box office poison. She had been uh, almost kicked out of the movie business. So she would, this sort of put her right, right back on top. If you remember going in the bar room scene where we had a big thing, she has this fight with this girl, yeah. and Una Merkel. And uh, when we were do doing the scene, uh, uh, they, they, they had two stunt girls with the, the exact costume of Marlena and, and Una, and they were standing in, <coughs> in back to do the fight. And Marlena, uh, uh, just as they were starting to do the fight, uh, Marlena said, what are those two girls with our, with our dresses on? And they said, well, they're going to do it. You can't. You, we, we want a real fight. And uh, Marlena said, Una and I are going to do the fight. And Una took it back because she didn't know she was going to do the fight either. But it sort of, uh, it sort of it created a... a something she said okay you said you want to do it I'll do it well if you remember the fight it was the darndest fight scene you've ever seen they really get the, got, got into it and, yeah. and gave one of the wonderful qualities that uh, that picture had when she started throwing stuff at me <laughs> uh, she said now uh, I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to throw it or where. I'm going to, you just make sure that you duck because I'm going to throw it right in, at your face. I didn't read now, and they say, it starts, Dear Mr. Stewart, I'm 12 years old. My mom and pop uh, liked your picture very much, and they uh, told me about one, and uh, I, I, I got a video of it, and I saw it, and I like the video thing. And it's given me a whole new audience. There's something about that movie that has a rhythm to it or um, something underneath, a theme to it, that young people Visual. get. Yes, Visual. exactly right. I think the motion picture business is, was actually invented, actually came about as a visual medium. In other words, you told the story visually w without relying on the spoken word. And a lot of the directors, John Ford in particular, John Ford said it very clearly as he was able to do to so many things. He, he said, if you are unable to tell your story visually, up there on the screen without relying on the spoken word, you're not using the medium correctly. And I've, I've never forgotten it, and I think it's true. There's, there are two or three directors who you've been identified with, and one of them is Alfred Hitchcock. Mm. In 1954, you did Rear Window, 
Um, Hitchcock had a reputation for being tough on actors. Uh, this was, it looked to me, a tough role. You basically acted this in a wheelchair, losing a lot of the tools that you would have in your instrument or uh, in the repertoire that you have as an actor in terms of body movement and so forth. Um, first of all, how did you find Hitchcock? Did you find him to be difficult or, no. or tough or demanding? No, no. I just say uh, it was something very special, something very special, but here again, visual. His cameraman, Bob Birch, he would tell him, after he finished the scene, he would do this, and Bob Birch would come back and he said, I want that, that's all. And he'd go back and sit in his, in his chair, and Birch would do the lighting and everything, and then he would come and he said, well, uh, I'm, all, I'm all it and everything. Hitchcock would said, all right, bring in the actors, go in and move around, and uh, don't run into the furniture and see, see, how, see how things work. This is, the, this is sort of the way, the, the way things work with Hitchcock. You mean leave the magazine? Yes. For what? For yourself and me. I could get you a dozen assignments tomorrow, fashions, portraits. When I don't laugh, I could do it. Well, that's what I'm afraid of. Can you see me driving down to the fashion salon in a Jeep, wearing combat boots and a three-day beard? Wouldn't that make a hit? I could see you looking very handsome and successful in a dark blue flannel suit. Now, uh, let's stop talking nonsense, shall we? Hmm? I guess I'd better start setting up for dinner. I remember one, and this was just a technical thing, that the... The uh, cameraman had to uh, do it because Hitchcock wanted to be have the camera behind me, looking through the camera to the the, the dance girl. You remember the dance girl, yeah. in, in, and he wanted me in focus here and the dance girl in focus too. Well, in order to do that, you know, camera wise, you have to turn the. Uh, turn the uh, lens down so you need a lot of light. Well, he used all the lights. It was a paramount where we were doing, used all the lights, and it wasn't enough. I did it. Bob Barks would give his, give his light meter and say, no, there's not enough. I'm not going to get the... Re so he got uh, uh, several of them from Columbia and uh, uh, from MGM, and he finally got, the, got some more lights. And finally, Bob said, that, and this took ha half a day to go. Uh, finally, uh, he said, this, this, uh, this is it. This is it. We got enough light. And just as he said that, the lights turned on the sprinkler system, and it started to rain. <laughs> and Hitchcock said, well, see if we can get somebody to stop the rain. Uh, and in the meantime, someone got me an umbrella. And he went and <laughs> sat in the chair and sat with an umbrella and, <laughs> until they, they stopped the rain. Yeah. When, when he came to you four years later to do Vertigo, were you happy for that opportunity to work with him? Did you oh. like that script? Oh, yeah. Hitchcock was, uh, was really very tough on the script girl because we maybe he liked to do long scenes, sort of, and then cut it up, and if there was an important thing to get in a little closer. But uh, after a long scene, the, he'd say, cut, print, that's fine, let's go. And the script girl would come up and say, Mr. Hitchcock, I, you, you've got to look here. Here, Stewart said that line almost completely backwards. <laughs> and then he said, well, it looked fine, print it. And <laughs> that, 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 there's the visual thing. But it also substantiates what you're saying, which is that if it looked right, and if it had the right um, visual flow, so that he knew it would cut together, he wasn't concerned whether the line came out this way or whether you said the words backwards. He knew he could cut it together right. to make the movie work. I don't want to go in there. I couldn't find her. And then I heard footsteps on the stairs. She was running up the tower. Right 
here. I see. She was running up the stairs and through the trap door at the top of the tower. And I tried to follow her, but I couldn't get to the top. I tried, but I couldn't get to the top. One doesn't often get a second chance. I want to stop being haunted. You're my second chance, Judy. You're my second chance. Get away! You look like Madeline now. Go up the stairs. No. Go up the stairs. Go up the stairs, Judy. And I'll follow. When you were growing up in, in Indiana, Pennsylvania, uh, do you remember going to the movies as a kid? Oh, sure. I'd, uh, Saturday matinee, they had uh, one picture Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then change into Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And my dad, who ran a hardware store, uh, he, uh, uh, the movies, but my mother, she'd go to all of them, but she made my dad, my dad, the hardware store stayed open on Saturday night and closed at 9 o'clock, and that was just when the, the uh, movie went on, and she made, made, uh, she made him go and sit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Sunday, he'd always called. He never got exactly the difference in time, so it was about 4.30 in the morning when he, Sunday, when he'd call. And he'd say, I saw the picture, uh, uh, and uh, he'd start telling me of, about the picture. <laughs> by, by his, the, the way he talked and everything, I knew exactly when he started to fall asleep in the picture. <laughs> was, was he proud of you? Did he say to your son, you know, you're out there, you're entertaining people. People all over America are looking at your films. No, your mom he, and I are real proud. He was all right about it, but I, he, he never quite understood the idea of uh, somebody making a life work of, of, of doing the motion picture. Never, uh, and this was okay. It was fine. We, we did an interview several years ago, and you told me that after you won an Academy Award, um, that he looked at it with a certain kind of skepticism, or in any event, he took it sort of for granted, but that he, you ended up sending him the Academy Award. The morning, the morning after the, and he still didn't understand, when it was quite early in the morning, after the Academy Awards, he said, the, uh, uh, son, the radio said you, uh, uh, that they gave you something out there. What was that, a plaque? Or, uh, <laughs> Uh, what do you, and I said, no, it's a statue. It's a very, very, very nice statue. He said, well, why don't you send it home and I'll put it in the window. So the next day I sent it home. It was there for 20 years in the, the front window <laughs> that, uh, the, the, of the store. You told me that at one point after it had been there for a couple of years, you said, well, Dad, I, I'd like to have my Academy Award back. And somehow he never wanted to return it to you, even though you asked. Is, is, isn't that right? You, no, he told me at the time. He said, no, it's, it's, doing, it's doing better here in the, the store window than it would on the shelf in your home. Yeah. It's generating a little business here is probably what it was. And I think so, yeah. yeah. I read that when you did Anatomy of a Murder, that he was not happy with that movie, and that he did not think that that was the kind of uh, moral proper film that he wanted his son to make. A customer in the hardware store, uh, and he, I, I think the customer just said, I, I, I just saw your son's latest picture, and uh, that was something when he held those girls' panties up, wasn't it? And he, he hadn't seen the picture, and uh, he called me the minute he heard about it, and he said, what kind of a terrible picture are you in, and uh, so on, so on. He wouldn't go and see it, uh, but according to my mother, uh, the picture did very well at home, and, and uh, everybody uh, saw it. Well, he said, no, no, I don't, it's a, it's a dirty picture. I don't, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't like the boy being on a dirty picture, but, uh, I guess uh, after about a year, and things went, Homer City, the little town about 
15, 16 miles uh, south of Indiana. We had one theater, and anatomy of a murder was planned out. Well, one night he sneaked down, didn't tell my mother, didn't tell anybody, he sneaked down and saw the picture. Uh, and the next day he called me, and he said, I, uh, I saw that picture, that, uh, and uh, it's, it's all right, it's a, it's a good picture. I don't know why he heard, had, had to hold the girl's panties up, but, <laughs> it, it, that, uh, uh, but the, it, the, the picture's all right, uh, so uh, uh, don't, don't worry about it. It, it, it. It'll do all right. Yeah. I also heard at one point, or I read in one story, that he was so unhappy when he first heard about it that he took out a little ad in the local newspaper. Yeah, don't go. Yeah, he this said, is don't go to see of this murder, film. And then, uh, it's a dirty picture. Don't go and see it. But it, he put that in the newspaper. Yeah, and the picture <laughs> did bigger business than any picture oh, I've ever been true. in That's in fine. Indiana, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Have you ever had occasion to go down into the laundry at any time? Yes. Part of my job is to sort various pieces of laundry as they come out of the wash and dry machine. Would you tell the court what you found among those pieces of laundry in the day after Mr. Quill was killed? I found a pair of woman's panties. Now, what did you do with them? I threw them in the rag bin. Well, when did you learn the significance of those panties? Here. This morning in the courtroom. And then you went home and got them out of the rag bin? Yes. Did you bring them with you? Yes. I offer this article of lingerie as exhibit number one for the defense. They're white, they have lace up the side, and they're badly torn, as if they'd been ripped apart by powerful hands. The label reads, Smart Shop, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Primadura Pedia, uh, uh, excellent director. You knew exactly what he wanted. And uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't selfish about his way. He and he gave you. He didn't say now in this in this scene I want so and so, and I want you to have this vision and this attitude to none of that. He just said, "All right." Uh, the cameraman would come up and said, we're set for the, what you want. And he said, all right, the actors, come in, come in and get and move around and see, see how this thing works. And uh, if uh, there were some things that he said, and he said, try it a little different. And, and this is the way he shot. When you look at all of these directors and the whole panorama of the, of the different men who you worked with, what do you think in retrospect made a good director? I think, basically, what I've said about the, the, uh, uh, their feeling that they wanted it visual. I think maybe Frank Capra was able to get that visual feeling, but was all, also able to bring scenes together without getting everybody in the corner and saying, now, uh, in this scene, I, I, I want to get out of this scene certain things that have to do with the story itself. And you are responsible a lot for getting so-and-so. You are responsible for none of this. Yeah. None of this. Yeah. None of this sitting around a table and saying, no, no, we have to do so-and-so. None of this. He had so much of the story, so much of the... Uh, well, in, in the case, the scene that he was just doing, he had so much of this in his mind exactly the way he wanted it to yes. turn out. It made it something uh, a, a little special for us all because we were sort of almost trying it for the first time. Yes. And so many times it, the first time worked, and that yeah. was it. I guess arguably the film that has not only come to embody values but to mean Jimmy Stewart to so many people is, of course, It's a Wonderful Life. That happened at a time in your life after the Second World War, and from what I've read and also from things that you told me, that was a time when you, you were scared, and I think Capra was scared. Uh, it had been years 
since you made a film. Mm -hmm. I think you were um, apprehensive that you had lost the knack, lost the timing, lost whatever it was that audiences went to and loved about you. So that you made that film um, with a certain fear that maybe it wasn't going to work. Um, and the, the person that sort of got me out of that, and this was, uh, this was sort of early in the film, uh, and I'll always be grateful to him for it, Lionel Barrymore called me over and, I, and he said, now look, I've been hearing things about you saying about my, uh, you've been away too long and you don't know in the uh, uh, acting, uh, maybe you forgot how to act. Now, you're, 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 you're not making any sense at all and I want you to stop it and I don't want to hear anything more about the crazy things you're talking about not knowing how to act anymore because you've been away too long and everything. Acting, acting is a very basic, wonderful profession. And I don't want you to make cracks about forgetting how to do it by being away too long. Now, don't let me hear this anymore, and I believe it, and I'll, I'll have you fired if you say one word more about uh, how you feel and you're worried about the, the, your acting career. Now, go, go on and do your job and do it good and forget about it and don't let me hear you say another word about forgetting how to act. Or, well, he let me, he really let me have it and uh, <laughs> it, uh, it was very good for me at the time. Married? Make me say 40 a week. 45. 45. 45. Out of which, after supporting your mother and paying your bills, you're able to keep, say, ten if you skimp. A child or two comes along and you won't even be able to save the ten. Now, if this young man of 28 was a common, ordinary yokel, I say he was doing fine. But George Bailey is not a common, ordinary yokel. He is an intelligent, smart, ambitious young man who hates his job who hates the building and loan almost as much as I do. A young man who's been dying to get out on his own ever since he was born. A young man, the smartest one in the crowd, mind you. A young man who has to sit by and watch his friends go places because he's trapped. Yes, sir, trapped into frittering his life away, playing nursemaid to a lot of garlic eaters. Do I paint a correct picture? Or do I exaggerate? Well, what's your point, Mr. Potter? My point? My point is I want to hire you. Hire me? Yeah, I want you to manage my affairs, run my property. George, I'll start you out at $20,000 a year. Frank Capra uh, called me about this, uh, this picture because my contract at MGM ran out during the war, so I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wasn't employed. I didn't have any, uh, uh, any job, and so he he really got me started into this. Yeah, yeah. And so many things. I the thing I was was thinking about the other day that uh, I don't I forget exactly where it was in the film, but I it was sort of after uh, when things were going very badly, and I I was I. I, I was at a bar, and I was sitting, and I looked up and, and, and prayed. Uh, uh, this was right at the time, I think, when I was going to kill myself. And they, this was a very desperate time, and prayed. And the scene affected me. And uh, as I looked, up like that, I, 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 I cried and the tears uh, came down. And uh, I finished the scene and Frank came up and said, I was too far away from you when you, when you did that. And there was, I, didn't, I, I didn't have the camera on wheels and I couldn't move in. And, uh, do, you, do you think you could do that again? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't. And, he said, well, I, I, I know, I'll, uh, and I, I found out this later, 
that that night Capra took that that amount of film when I was looking up praying and down and the tear he took the film that uh, and I forget how many feet that, that that part of the film frame by frame and in, enlarged it enlarged it and photographed it again but on new film and had it photographed so so that the the, the uh, it became a close-up took them all night all night and uh, to to change this uh, and uh, and make it a close-up This is now regarded uh, as a favorite film by probably more people than any other movie in the world. I see this all the time. But the truth is that when it came out, you told me this was not a very popular movie. It was not a great smash with the critics or even at the box office. No, and uh, I've been trying to figure out, and I, and I remember Frank Capra and I talked about it, and, he, and his... His theory, and I think probably it was right because he was writing so darn many things that had to do with the audience reaction and so on. He felt that at this time, right after the war, the people that had their sons and husbands and in the war and all the tragedies of the war and everything, and the, 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 the whole the sort of feeling of the whole country was, uh, you know, a depression in a way. So at the end of the war, although it was a victory for us, so they, 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 didn't, uh, they, they didn't want the, the sort of the picture with problems. They, they wanted to last. Well, you gave them a very nice film that let people laugh. That was when you played Elwood P. Dowd. And this goes forward now a couple of years to 1950, when you did uh, Har uh, Harvey mm. for Henry Coster. Uh, the play had been running two years. I saw the uh, play, and uh, between the acts, the, the producer, Brock Pemberton, came down, he said, how do you like it? And I said, I, I, just, I just love every minute of it. And he said, well, uh, do you want to do it? And I thought he was kidding. And I said, oh, Frank Fay, he, it's his part. I don't, I, I don't know how. Well, in three weeks, I was doing it. <laughs> and I got the worst reviews from the critics. And they said it themselves, this, this is the worst review I've ever given, and Stuart deserves it. <laughs> well, I, uh, but I did it, and I, uh, the more I did it, the more I fell in love with this rabbit. But I did it for three weeks, I think. And the next year, Pemberton called me and said, Frank Fay sort of liked that vacation he had last year, and he wants to take another one. Would you come back? And by this time, I'd sort of been, uh, I had sort of uh, been mad at those critics back then. I said, maybe I could go on and, and uh, really d do a little better job for them. Maybe they So I went back again. Pemberton invited all the critics back uh, to see it again, which he told me he would because, it, you know, the reviews this time were worse than the ones before. <laughs> but I... I, I I loved the play so much, and I loved the character, the, the whole thing. 
that I played it for another three weeks. And those two times, although uh, the reviews weren't any good, it gave me a little bit of an edge when uh, it was sold to the movies, so that I was able to get the, yeah. uh, uh, the part of the movie. And now, Aunt Ethel, I'd like you to meet Harvey. Harvey, you've heard me speak of Aunt Ethel Chauvinet. She's one of my oldest and dearest friends. She's the one who... Hmm? Uh, that's right. Well, this is the one. No, no, she's the one. She, <laughs> he says he would have known you anywhere. Well, uh, now we must go in and greet the rest of our friends. Come on, Harvey. Oh, uh, Aunt Ethel, you pardon me, you're, you're standing in his way. There we are. Oh, that, I, I'll see you in a minute. Aunt Ethel, I can see that you're disturbed about Harvey. Now, please don't be. He stares that way at everybody. It's, it's his way. But he likes you, I can tell. He likes you very much. And you once said uh, that the I'm characters coming, you had played before the war, they weren't working because the country had changed. The tenor of the country had changed. And Winchester 73 was an opportunity that you had to do a different kind of work, and it really restored your career. Is that is that a fair assessment? Well, in a way, in a way, it is. It uh, it, it got me, it it got me into the western uh, thing, which uh, was a tremendous bit of good fortune, and uh, which was uh, it came to be a very important thing yeah. in uh, the, in my career, and it was. A time. I I think one of one of the most important things. It was the time when I met a great friend of mine, a horse whose name was Pi. So Stevie Myers, Stevie Myers, the daughter of Roy Myers, who was a, a, a he supplied horses for all the great Tom Mix and Gene Autry and all all the the. Uh, the people and when, when the big westerns were gone. When he died, he gave the, he gave the business over to Stevie, and she worked. And uh, at Universal, they asked her, they said, you've got to pick out a horse. And they brought these big slugging horses, and then I got on, and I said, they're all, they, they, they look like they're, uh, we, we've got to have to have a, a wagon they're pulling behind it. Do you have any? And I just, as we were doing, I, I noticed uh, the head of a horse peeking around the stage, right? And I said, what's that? She said, that's my horse. I, I said, could I just see him? Could I just get on him and see him? Well, I got on him, and I just knew immediately. And to make a long story short, I, uh, she, she said, I won't sell him, and I won't uh, uh, do him, but I'll let you ride him, and I, uh, because he's thrown a lot of people, and uh, they, they don't uh, care much, but he's my horse, and I'm going to keep him, and I keep him at, at my home in the valley, and uh, I don't, but I'll let you ride him, and nobody else. I rode him for 20 years. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll never forget him. your horses, two bits in the crowd with grain feed, four bits at the stall. <laughs> Real clean stall? Yes, sir. You can look for yourself. Uh, you look like an honest man. Yeah. Uh, take your word for it, mister. Before you went into the war, before you enlisted, you did the Philadelphia story with Katherine Hepburn. And I think for a lot of people, she represents uh, a consummate actress, but also an artist, the person who brings, as you do, an overview of of this profession what you're saying is that she as far as the acting profession as far as, as picture making and everything there's never been anybody like her that had the knowledge of how how to make things come into being in in the movie in the mo motion picture uh, but 
in a, in a very personal way, and I, I've never seen it in any other actress, in a very personal way, she was able to, in a scene, she, she was able to mold the scene into something that was very, very special, and something that I, I, uh, I, I, I it's the only time I've, I've ever experienced it. Yeah. And, and it was a w wonderful, wonderful education for me, and a wonderful experience for me. The magnificence that comes out of your eyes and your voice and the way you stand there and the way you walk, you're lit from within, Tracy. You've got fires banked down in you, hearth fires and holocausts. I don't think you're made of bronze. No, you're made out of flesh and blood. That's the blank, unholy surprise of it. Oh, you're the golden girl, Tracy. Full of life and warmth and delight. What goes on? You've got tears in your eyes. Shut up, shut up. Oh, Mike, keep talking, keep talking, talk, will you? No, no, I... I've stopped. Why? Has your mind taken hold again, dear Professor? Well, good thing, don't you? Don't you agree? No, Professor. All right, lay off that Professor stuff now. Do you hear me? Yes, Professor. It's really all I am to you, is it? Of course, Professor. Are you sure? Why, yes. Yes, of course. Golly. Getting into that film, it was, it was pure, purely just a bit of good fortune for me. Because I did, I did, I did a Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn, and all the, 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 the enormous. But she uh, chose you, didn't she? she yeah. It was Kate Hepburn's choice that yeah. she wanted Jimmy yeah. Stewart to play Mike Connor. Yeah. And that was the film that won you an Academy Award. Which was completely a, a, a surprise. I had no idea. I had no it came a complete, complete surprise. When you look back, you've spent your life virtually, your whole professional life in this business. Um, what do you think of this? What, what do you think of movies as a business, as, as a profession, as, as, a, as a way to make a living? I've developed a feeling that it's a great profession, that it's an honorable profession. And personally, it's given me a wonderful life, but it's a life that has been blessed by a tremendous, a tremendous amount of good fortune. Well, I, I, I want to tell you, I want to thank you so much for coming uh, today and for sharing so much of yourself and with so much candor. Well, I thank you so much. I mean, this, this is one of the most unforgettable uh, sort of time of conversation that I've uh, that I've ever had, and I, I, I'm so grateful to you because it's, it's meant a great deal to me, this, this, uh, uh, this uh, time we've had and the things you've asked and the things that have come up that have reminded me so much. And I have, I have you to thank for, for that, and I'm very grateful, and I, I thank you with all my heart. This series is part of a broad program in adult education produced by the Center for the Motion Picture Arts. Viewers are welcome to join our classes, seminars, and film festival cruises. For further information, write Reflections, 1202 Lexington Avenue, New York, 10028.
Next on American Movie Classics, Kirk Douglas stars as a rough and tumble fur trapper seeking his fortune on the untamed Mississippi River. The Big Sky, directed by Howard Hawks. It's next on American Movie Classics. I was. Amy Booth. Join host Leonard Malbrin for a journey through the imagination, fantasy, 